world can enjoy freedom of religion. I thank the uh, Leader of the House for answering the business questions. And we now come to the backbench debate on change of name by registered sex offenders. And before I call um, Sarah Champion, um, I just remind all members that they should not refer to any cases which are active before the courts. They can, of course, discuss the principles of the issue without referring to specific cases. Sarah Champion to move. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this House is considered change of name by registered sex offenders. I am grateful to have the opportunity to lead this debate, and I would like to thank all the members who have supported this campaign. I would particularly like to thank the survivors, many of whom are here today, for their tireless work to try and close this loophole and make sure no one else suffers as they have been forced to. This debate is specific. It is about registered sex offenders changing their name without the knowledge of the police, leading to many offenders going missing securing a disclosure and barring service DBS check under the new name and then reoffending. Unless this loophole is closed, it makes a nonsense of the schemes the public rely on to detect offenders. For example, the Sexual Offenders Register, the Child Sex Offenders Disclosure System, the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme and the Disclosure and Barring Service, all of which are reliant on having the correct name. I first found out about this dangerous loophole through the incredible campaigning work of the Safeguarding Alliance three years ago. Their findings and the impact it's had on survivors is truly chilling. I've repeatedly raised this issue with the Home Office and Justice Ministers, as well as the Master of Roles, who oversees the enrolled depot. Yet still, no tangible change has taken place. Currently, under the Sexual Offences Act 2003, all registered sex offenders are legally required to notify the police of any change in their personal details, including their change of name and address. Would the Honourable Lady give way? I will, of course, give way. Can I first of all commend the Honourable Lady for Rotherham for bringing this forward? I think every one of us in this House uh, uh, support her in everything she does and, and we greatly admire her tenacity and courage uh, on, on these issues. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be here for the debate today because I have other engagements to go to. But does the member not agree that the fact that there have been 11,536 prosecutions made against sex offenders for failing to notify the police of a change in their personal information, such as their name, during a period from 2019 to June 22, shows the scale, the scale of this issue here, and the fact that we must legislate to protect our vulnerable as a matter of urgency. I know that's what the honourable lady wants. That's certainly what I want as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend, who is as tenacious as I am to try and challenge these gross um, abuses of the system that we hold dear. And the figures he quoted, safeguarding alliance uh, figures that they got from Freedom of Information, but that was only some of the police forces. Yeah. So the actual scale of it is much greater than even that shocking figure. If a registered sex offender wanted to change their name, they must tell the police within three days or they could face up to five years in prison. But these notification requirements leave the onus entirely on the offender to self-report changes in their personal information. If the sex offender breaches these requirements and therefore faces prison, they must first be caught. Data, which I and others have collated, shows the scale of this issue is breathtaking. The Home Office confirmed, in responses to my written parliamentary questions, that over 16,000 offenders were charged with a breach of their notification requirements between 2015 and 2020. The Safeguarding Alliance FOI request to the CPS found over 11,500 registered sex offenders were prosecuted for failing to notify changes of information between 2019 and 2022. The breach could, and are likely to have been, for name changes or other details. So whilst it's clear that offenders are changing their names and not disclosing their new name to the police, the exact scale of the problem remains impossible to capture. It's important to emphasise these are only the cases we know about. Yep. There could have been many more offenders who breached their notification requirements without the police's knowledge. Offenders are also required to visit a police station to comply with notification requirements, but only once a year. Evidently, thousands are getting caught when they are breaching their requirements, but it appears many are not. 
An FOI carried out by the Safeguarding Alliance to police forces confirmed at least 913 registered sex offenders have gone missing between 2017 and 2020. However, only 17 of the 45 police forces responded to this request, indicating that figure is only the tip of the iceberg. New data secured by the BBC demonstrates the same ongoing pattern, allowing offenders to slip through the cracks. Over 700 registered sex offenders have gone missing within the last three years. It's highly likely they breached their notification requirements without getting caught, making them an active risk to the public. Again, only 31 of 45 police forces responded to this request. Many offenders are following the rules. At least 1,400 registered sex offenders have notified police forces of name changes in the past three years, with 21 of 45 forces able to provide this data. However, the number of cases where notification requirements are not being obeyed far outweighs those where they are. We cannot rely on a system that depends on registered offenders self-reporting changes in their information. If we don't urgently improve this system, we have to accept that hundreds more offenders will continue to disappear from the system that is meant to safeguard us. When I first learned about this breach, I spoke to my local police chief. He was genuinely stunned. He was unaware of the loophole and asked how he was meant to find someone when they no longer knew who they were looking for. If we are going to protect children and vulnerable people and prevent further abuse, we must be able to keep track of those who are already known to be a safeguarding risk. Unless we address this failure in the current system, police will continue to be unaware of a name change and the sex offenders register won't be up to date with the new names, therefore considerably reducing its effectiveness. It's vital we remember not only the danger posed to society by sex offenders changing their names, but also the devastating impact it has on their previous victims. Della Wright is an ambassador for the Safeguarding Alliance and a survivor of child sexual abuse. Della has spoken so bravely to tell her story in support of so many other victims who have been impacted by this serious safeguarding loophole. I pay huge credit to her as her tenacious campaigning is what has brought this issue to the public attention. When Della was a child, a man came to live in her home, becoming one of her primary carers and repeatedly sexually abusing her. Years later, when Della reported the abuse, her abuser was already known to the police and he had committed further sexual offences against many more victims. Della was made aware that he had changed his name He'd changed his name at least five times, enabling him to relocate under the radar and evade justice. When Della's case was finally brought to court, he once again changed his name, this time in between being charged and appearing in court for the plea hearing. This slowed down the whole process as new court papers needed to be submitted in the new name. This additional distress to Della made a complete mockery of the justice system. But sadly, Della's case is far from unique. The Safeguarding Alliance are working with dozens of survivors who have discovered their abuser has changed their name, and a number of those are here today. Many say their perpetrators changed their name before charging, meaning their birth name still remains unmaligned. Perhaps most chilling for me is that with a new name, you can apply for a new passport and driving licence, which then means you can apply for a clean DBS check in that new name. On, on that point, um, I thank the Honourable Member for, for securing this really, really important debate, because in addition to ensuring that registered sex offenders have markers on their files at the DVLA and HMPR, would my Honourable Friend agree with me that the DBS should require all applicants to produce a birth certificate to better identify and um, verify their identity? Um, I support my Honourable Friend's recommendation. Anything we can do to try and close this loophole, I support, because the scale of it and the fact that the systems we have in place are not working means that we need, Minister, we need urgent attention and urgent reforms on this. 
BBC research found that more than 2,000 criminal records carried out, record checks carried out by the DBS in the past three years flagged the applicants had cautions or convictions and that they had supplied incorrect or missed out personal details, such as their purse names. These figures are shocking. Whilst it's a relief the DBS found so many of these cases, if even a few slip through the gaps in the system, the consequences are devastating. I will, of course, give way. To the Honourable Lady, and I pay tribute to, and I hope I added my name in support of this uh, debate. And I'm, it's breathtaking. I mean, I raised this issue, I think it was over six years ago, when we had the case of Ben Lewis, who changed his name, having been convicted and put on the sex offenders register, and then turned up in Spain working with children, was only found out about accidentally through Australian police, I think it was. The Home Office acknowledged this was absolutely a problem and was taken on board. But the fact that there are 67,000 sex offenders on the register in this country, 16,000 have changed their names. Um, it, this isn't just a tip of the iceberg. This is deliberately being used as a cover for their identity and potential future criminal activity. Will she agree with me that, frankly, other than in exceptional circumstances, people on the sex offenders register should not be allowed to change their name whilst they are on the sex offenders register? And secondly, there is absolutely no reason that somebody in prison should be able to change their name whilst they're serving a prison sentence. It's not necessary, and it's clearly for ulterior motives that cannot be good. But my personal position is when you carry out these heinous crimes, some of your liberties are going to be taken away. Mm -hmm. And what we need the minister to do is look very closely at what those liberties are particularly when there is an incredibly apparent, as my honourable friend has outlined, safeguarding risk with names being changed. I'm actually going to come on to Ben Lewis because I think he highlights um, a number of the flaws in the system. And can I just at this point say to the Minister, the systems we have aren't joined up and there are people that are actively looking for those weaknesses and exploiting them. Mm -hmm. And I urge her to do all she can to close those up as quickly as possible. On, on, on that point? Please. And again, the Honourable Lady's been very generous. So I thank her for it. Uh, I think my constituents, the Honourable Lady's constituents, and indeed every constituent within this House today and outside of this House, want to see legislation that get, gives uh, paramount safety to mothers and children. We don't see that at the moment. I think the Honourable Lady has reinforced it very directly towards the Minister. Does she feel that the day's uh, debate in this House should be the start of a campaign to change legislation in favour and protect those people who are under threat? Um, I completely agree with my Honourable Friend. And What I would say is the fact that so many MPs are here and Thursdays is usually the day that we're in our constituencies. So I know that the people in this room have changed their diaries to show their support and solidarity over this point. And I hope the minister recognises that. Registered sex offenders are supposed to inform the police if they go abroad. But again, this is not always happening. I turn to the example of Ben Lewis. Ben was a registered sex offender who changed his name, moved to Spain, obtained clean DBS checks under his new name. He then worked in British schools in Madrid until he was arrested for further offences. I'm in touch with the mother of one of the children he abused, and I thank her for all the campaigning she has done to raise awareness of this safeguarding failure, but it shouldn't have happened. Action to stop this happening is long overdue. Almost two years ago, with cross-party support, I tabled a new clause to the Police Crime and Sentences Court Bill which required the government to conduct a review into registered sex offenders changing their names. We know this review has been completed, Where is it? but ministers now say it's an internal document and the findings will not be published. What? The Home Office also asked former Chief Constable Mick Creedon to carry out an independent review into the management of sex offenders in the community. One assumes, but we don't know the terms, that it should have covered this issue. But again, we have no information on its findings. This is clearly an interest that the public are acutely aware of. 
Over 37,000 people signed a petition calling for action on this topic over two years ago. Public money is being spent, but we have seen no outcomes. We need transparency to know that ministers are working to provide solutions to these issues. And so I'd be really grateful today if the minister is able to update us on these reviews. What can be done to address this loophole? <coughs> there are simple, immediate changes which can take place to address some of these failures in safeguarding. The College of Policing guidance states police can take preemptive action where an offender is likely to change their identity or leave the country. These actions request the Passport Office and DVLA, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency, to put an electronic marker on the offender's file to alert the officer in charge if an application should be made. As I've said earlier, a driver's licence or passport is required for a DBS check, so this would also prevent registered sex offenders acquiring a clean DBS check if, they applied, uh, if it was applied to all registered sex offenders' files. However, the guidance states that, I quote, to avoid unnecessary or high volumes of requests, these, these agencies' inquiries should be limited limited to where, apparently, there is a specific risk factor applying, which means that this isn't being applied to all sex offenders, and I would say all registered sex offenders are a risk. A risk. <laughs> I believe this electronic tagging must be mandatory for all registered sex offenders. Admittedly, I accept that this would only retrospectively alert the police to an aid change, but at least it enables them to act and keep track of offenders' identity once a breach occurs, and it's better than what we have already. It wouldn't pick up on the cases where offenders have already changed their names, so I would do everything I can to work with the Minister to find a solution to those that have already carried out that change. In response to a BBC FOI request, neither the Passport Office nor the DVLA were able to provide the detailed answers requested on how often they actually use these measures. The deed poll records team at the Royal Courts of Justice in London said it, uh, I quote, we simply enrolled the change of name of applications completed by the applicants. That's a very passive position to take. It did say <coughs> that they would check for a particular change of name for a specific year when a Data Protection Act request had been received. So again, it requires the police or ministers to proactively ask for that information, information that a sex offender can just change without any restraint. I understand that there may be sensitive information linked to these requests, but parliamentarians and the public must be assured that these systems are being used effectively. I also appreciate electronic flagging every registered sex offender's file requires additional resources, but surely it would be worth the cost to prevent the risk of more offences. To be clear, when sex offenders are no longer on the register, this requirement, in my opinion, would not be necessary. However, exploitation of the current system by hundreds of sex offenders is happening and action needs to be taken now. I'm not asking for a ban on all registered sex offenders from changing their name. We must take a nuanced approach and also how, how, how would we monitor that scheme if the responsibility is left to them. Circumstances differ and we must allow the police the operational independence to make decisions as to whether or not offenders should be able to change their name. However, where these decisions are made, victims and survivors must be informed, safeguarding must be prioritised, and the systems must be joined up so that registered offenders can be tracked, regardless of the name they use. Thank you. Yeah. The question is, as on the order paper, uh, Lucy Allen. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for calling me to speak in this very important debate. And I am so grateful to the Honourable Lady, uh, the Member for Rotherham, for all the work that she has done for victims and survivors. And while Under Secretaries may come and go, it is so reassuring to see the Honourable Lady in her place constantly standing up for victims and survivors. Now, I want to tell the story of my constituent, Joanna. 
Joanna is an amazing young woman. She's bright, she's brave, and she's beautiful. Joanna is a student paramedic, and she's just started a family, and she has her whole life ahead of her. Joanna wants her story to be told, because for too long there was silence. It is by speaking out that we do secure justice for victims and survivors such as Joanna, and we must listen to their voices. For much of her young life, Joanna was a victim of serious sexual abuse. She was the victim of a manipulative, depraved man called Clive Bundy. The scale and nature of the abuse is beyond comprehension, and it was discovered when the police identified sexual images online. Clive Bundy was arrested, and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. After serving only seven years, Clive Bundy is up for parole. This child sex offender is no longer Clive Bundy. This person has changed their name by deed poll. And this person has changed their gender identity. Under the law, Clive Bundy no longer exists. Clive Bundy has chosen the name of Claire Fox. Under Section 22 of the Gender Recognition Act, we cannot say even that this is so. Joanna's fear is this new identity erases Clive Bundy, erases the terrible harm he did, erases Joanna's experience. She feels the world can refuse to acknowledge Clive Bundy and his terrible crimes, even that they ever existed. We could just pretend the trauma she still suffers, the trauma Clive Bundy caused her and others, well, it didn't happen. He doesn't exist. What is certain is that Claire Fox will be afforded enhanced rights of privacy that should never, ever be afforded to a serious child sex offender. I believe in redemption. I believe in rehabilitation. But that does not mean, that cannot mean, that we rewrite the past. It doesn't mean that these truly horrific crimes simply never happened. Now, Joanna wants the names of Clive Bundy and Claire Fox to be linked on official records because Clive Bundy and Claire Fox are the same person. The law requires us all to pretend that this isn't so. The law requires us to pretend that a convicted serial <coughs> child sex offender, Clive Bundy, no longer exists. Now, the impact on Joanna is deeply distressing. She speaks of her past coming back to haunt her, of the constant fear of always looking over her shoulder, her anxiety that her new life and her young family could be under threat. That she is, in her words, once again, that young, abused, scared little girl that no one protected. Now we're told this is a loophole in the disclosure barring service that perhaps can be fixed, but I'm going to call it what it is. This is a grotesque injustice to victims, victims that we failed, victims that we will fail again if we allow the law to pretend the crimes of sexual offenders like crime Clive Bundy can be expunged by deed poll and never referred to again. Now, whether Claire Fox is a continuing threat to society, that's a matter for the parole board, and this is an issue I will be pursuing with the relevant minister through separate avenues. The debate today is about whether sex offenders can erase their identities. Madam Deputy Speaker, the rights of victims and the vulnerable matter more than the rights of serial child sex offenders. We all know that is the case. So I ask the Minister to be brave enough to say that is the case and to have the courage to stand up and change the law for Joanna and for Della and for all those victims that will come after them if we do not act. Uh, Joanna Cherry. Oh, thank you. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I actually want to raise the same point as the Honourable Member for Telford has just uh, raised. Um, clearly, this debate centred on the law and practice in England and Wales, but similar problems exist in Scotland, and Disclosure Scotland operate the same model. Just as a prelude, in a previous life, I worked for many years as a specialist sex crimes prosecutor with the National Sex Crimes Unit in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in Scotland. So I'm acutely aware of the importance of the effect of prosecution of sex crime, particularly for protecting women and girls, but also children and, and some men. 
Um, I'm also very aware of the importance of safeguarding and how those who wish to abuse their power by sexually abu abusing women and children will seek out loopholes and will seek out opportunities to find new victims. So today I want to focus on the safeguarding loophole created by the ability to change identity in a more fundamental way by simultaneously changing both name and a gender. Now it's worth reminding, and I, and I should say, um, I've been assisted in writing my speech today in understanding this issue uh, by Dr Kate Coleman of the organisation Keep Prisons Single Sex, who campaign for prisons in the United Kingdom to be single sex, but they also campaign for data on offending to be recorded by sex registered at birth through the criminal justice uh, system. Now, the Disclosure and Barring Service plays a vital and unique role in safeguarding by processing criminal record checks for individuals who have applied to work in roles where safeguarding uh, considerations apply. And the DBS allows organisations to, to access key information that will assist them in making safer recruiting decisions. And the ability of a DBS check to play this role in safeguarding rests entirely on the relevance, completeness and accuracy of the information returned and displayed on the DBS certificate. Now, as everyone will, will recall, in December 23, Ian Huntley was convicted of the terrible murders of two little girls, Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells. And at the time of committing the murders, Huntley had been employed at a local college as a caretaker, a position that facilitated his access to children. And that's what uh, people who want to abuse children do. They seek out positions where they will have access to children. And although he'd previously come into contact with the police over alleged sexual offences, on many occasions, that information had not been disclosed to his employers during the vetting check carried out at the time of his appointment. And it's no exaggeration to say that the murders of those two little girls and the subsequent discovery that Huntley should and could have been prevented from taking up the role of caretaker had a profound effect throughout the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And in 2004, following an independent inquiry, the Bichard Inquiry Report was published. And this concluded that there had been extensive omissions and failures in the vetting process. Now, significantly, Huntley had been able to change his name by deed poll to Ian Nixon, and the criminal record check he underwent had only been carried out against the new identity. So by presenting a new identity, Huntley had successfully severed the link with his existing police records, meaning that the records held against this name, Ian Huntley, were not disclosed. And uh, Yes, I will. Thank the Honourable Lady for giving way, and I do apologise to the Deputy Speaker for being late. I would have liked to have contributed to this, but there's a machine selling me the ticket broke and I missed my train, so I do apologise for just coming in to make an intervention. This is such an important debate, and I do pay tribute to the Member for Rotherham for securing it and the work she's done on it. But as the Honourable Member has just been talking about, the changing of the name of by deed poll, and then to apply for a DBS check to work with children entirely de defeats the object of the Sex Offenders Register. Does uh, the Honourable Lady agree with me that the requirement for sex offenders to notify the authorities themselves is entirely unfit for purpose, and that there needs to be a much more robust and centralised mechanism in which um, sex offenders can apply to change their names. I could not, I could not agree more. And uh, the Honourable Lady's intervention has reminded me that at the outset of my speech, I should have congratulated <laughs> the Honourable Member for Rotherham, who, as always, is completely across her, topic, her subject matter and quite often raises really important issues, both in this House and in the public domain, that others have not dared to raise. And I really want to pay tribute to her. But uh, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right in her intervention. And I'm talking about the Huntley case because I think it's really quite disgraceful that 18 years later, 
safeguarding loopholes created where applicants submit identity, doc identity documents for DBS checks that display a new identity, those same safeguarding loopholes still remain, despite the efforts of various honourable members yeah. in this House uh, to uh, raise them. Now, at least the government has acknowledged the safeguarding loophole created where registered sex offenders are able to change their name by deed poll. But I'm afraid that the ability to change identity in a more fundamental way that we heard so par we heard about so powerfully from the previous uh, honourable member's speech, the ability to change identity in a more fundamental way by simultaneously changing both one's name and one's gender remains unaddressed. And any individual can easily and for any reason change their name and their gender on documents commonly used to establish identity via a process of self-declaration. And that's an area where in our public life across the United Kingdom, self-identification has become a de, facto, uh, a de facto fact without actual legislation. So anyone can change their name and gender on documents commonly used to establish identity via a process of self-declaration. And these documents include a passport and a driving licence, and they can, they can be presented for the purposes of a DBS check and will show the individual's new name and their acquired gender instead of and as opposed to uh, their sex. Now, the, the DBS grants enhanced privacy rights to individuals who change their gender when changing their identity. And these are exceptional rights that are only granted to individuals in that group. And the result is that identity verification is compromised, meaning that there's no guarantee that the information returned during the check and displayed on the certificate will be accurate or complete. And these exceptional privacy rights also allow an applicant who's changed gender to request that all their previous names are withheld from the DBS certificate that is issued. And this right to conceal previous ad identities is not given to anybody else. Um, and disclosing your previous identity is a key component of safeguarding. And DBS certificates issued to other individuals display all other names the applicant has used. Now, no doubt there were good reasons for the privacy uh, requirements set out in Section 22 of the Gender Reform Act. And uh, I uh, hasten to add that I am completely in favour for equal rights for trans people, but I am not in favour of a system that allows sex offenders to exploit the principle of self-declaration to evade the safeguarding process. And Madam Deputy Speaker, applicants who change their gender are also permitted to conceal their sex and the DBS certificate issued will display their acquired gender instead. Now, this right is not granted to any other individual, and the importance of sex to safeguarding means that for all other applicants, their sex is always displayed on the DBS certificate. So these are all serious risks to safeguarding that compromise the validity and reliability of the DBS regime. And it's a particular problem as we roll out digital identities, including for DBS checks, because there's a risk that the, that the existing loopholes will be perpetuated in the digital realm. And in the drive for convenience and ease of use, digital identities also risk creating a new safeguarding loophole. In-person identity verification acts as a safeguarding protection in and of itself, but digital identities can be shared remotely meaning that, that important step of in-person identity verification is removed. So the current operation of the DBS regime means that identity verification is compromised and organisations requesting DBS checks cannot have confidence in the information that is disclosed. And I think there are ways, steps that we could take to close these loopholes one is mandatory use of national insurance numbers for DBS checks and identity changes. Another is that DBS certificates should display the sex registered at birth. And a third is that DBS certificates display other names used for all applicants, including those who've changed gender as part of changing identity. Now, we're talking here about rules of safeguarding for people who have been convicted exactly. 
of sex offences. And so it really, this, all of this should really be a bit of a no-brainer. But in order to be effective, the rules of safeguarding must apply equally to everyone. Yes, I will take an intervention. I'm very grateful to another lady, and I'm really pleased that she's raised this uh, I I issue. And it is extraordinary that now, more than 20 years on from Soham, that the issues which came up then, we are still addressing here uh, today. It seems absolutely a no-brainer, as she puts it, and I think there's a degree of uh, agreement here, that those who have committed heinous crimes... Uh, and who still oppose, uh, still um, uh, effectively uh, have a potential to harm uh, uh, children through sex offending uh, history, that their full identity should be available to those who need to have DBS checks who are taking them into uh, employment. And frankly, the gender qualifications, the change of gender for qualifications, which I fully uh, un understand, which are necessary, should not apply to sex uh, offenders. And a full change of name history must be automatically linked to a DBS, uh, and a change of name must be automatically linked to a DBS check to make sure that all that information is available for those people who are posing a risk to vulnerable children. So I, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. He correctly encapsulates what it is that, that I am asking for. Um, in order to be effective, the rules of safeguarding must apply equally to everyone, and there mustn't be loopholes or get-outs. And whenever the members of one group are excused from the normal requirements of safeguarding, a loophole is created that's ripe for exploitation. And I just want to make one final point before I sit down. I'm sure we will hear that abusing the process and failing to disclose previous names is an offence. But that's just not good enough. A minor matter of administrative fraud, making a false declaration, is nothing in comparison to the significant risk posed by sex offenders abusing this system, which is really ripped open by the loopholes I've described. And it's high time that the safeguarding loopholes resulting where people can change their identity, where sex offenders can change their identity, are addressed. Thank you. Uh, Mark Fletcher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. In anticipation of the